Uh, my name is Alex Whiting. I am a professor here. Uh, I know many of you. Uh, and I'm also a co-director of the Criminal Justice Program of Study, Research, and Advocacy. We're working on changing the name. Uh, and uh, we have today a terrific event. Uh, I'm supposed to say that it's being recorded so that if you ask a question um, or otherwise express some view or something, which I don't encourage, you, will, you are consenting to being recorded uh, by that act. Um, I have also, there are bio, uh, bios of our two guests uh, to save time. Uh, if you don't have one, they're on the chairs over there. So this is a terrific and um, unusual event uh, to have a sitting federal judge and the assistant attorney general for the criminal division on the same stage exchanging uh, frank and candid and honest views about uh, corporate prosecution. Uh, I'm going to put questions to them. I'm going to resist cross-examination, even though I'm tempted. It's really a, 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 a huge temptation. Um, and then I will uh, open it up to questions. I also encourage you to put questions to each other, if you like, and, uh, because we're really trying to get um, sort of the different perspectives and different views on this issue about prosecuting corporations, uh, when okay, and how. Okay, mostly. how quickly can we get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so the, 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 the topic is when and how. Let's start with when. Uh, and uh, Judge Rakoff, I'm going to start with you. Um, you have expressed elsewhere uh, skepticism about the utility of prosecuting, prosecuting corporations at all. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit why you're skeptical? So just before I answer that, I, I want to express my thanks to uh, Professor Whiting uh, for inviting me here. And uh, it's always great to be back at Harvard Law School. Um, uh, I was a student here in the so-called paper chase era. Um, and that's when I really learned what pain and suffering is all about. <laughs> um, and I also want to say that although Professor Whiting said he was going to try to uh, stir up some controversy. Uh, the truth is that uh, I'm a huge admirer uh, of Leslie Caldwell, and I think the Department of Justice over the last two years has undergone uh, a very positive change that we may get into uh, in, in uh, their emphasis. Um, and it's, in my view, it's because uh, Loretta Lynch is the uh, um, Attorney General, uh, Sally Yates is the Deputy Attorney General, and Leslie Caldwell is the head of the Criminal Division. And the, the, as you can see, uh, there, uh, there's a certain gender similarity uh, there. And it's a well-known scientific fact that uh, women are smarter than men. Um, and Therefore, there's been this positive change. And I only mention all this because since I suffer, therefore, from a gender disability, I hope you will cut me some slack uh, as we go forward. Um, but um, to answer the question, I've never seen the justice in prosecuting corporations for the following reasons. First, it's a cop-out. Um, people are the people who commit crimes. If a crime is committed in behalf of a corporation and the corporation uh, made money as a result, then of course it, it should be civilly liable. But uh, in terms of who actually did the deed, it was individuals, in my view, often uh, high-ranking individuals. Um, and therefore, you ought to go after the people who actually committed the crime. Second, my own view is that the deterrence benefit of going after individuals is far greater than any uh, uh, going after corporations. For corporations, a criminal um, prosecution is largely an economic decision. Uh, one, they're often driven to because they're not really in a position to fight in the long run against the government. Um, the 
but for an individual, uh, the stakes are prison, and that uh, has a huge, in my view, deterrent effect. I was, uh, after being a federal prosecutor for seven years, I was a criminal defense lawyer doing white-collar crime for about 15 years, and the common denominator was that all my clients feared prison f to uh, an immense degree. They Fines, restitution, compliance, whatever, they, that didn't bother them at all. But prison was something they really feared. I think that's where deterrence lies. And finally, um, I think prosecuting corporations is um, filled with downsides because to the extent you impose big fines, they're being paid by ultimately by the shareholders and by the employees uh, who may be fired uh, if the company goes into uh, the tank. Um, these are all innocent people who had nothing to do with the crime. Um, uh, and you have to make certain um, uh, compromises. For example, if you don't want to run the company uh, out of business for those reasons, because of those collateral consequences. So then you have to maybe cut a deal with a subsidiary or something of that sort to avoid uh, automatic uh, disbarment, such as in the pharmaceutical area. Um, and finally, I think uh, the, there's a lot of indication that the compliance measures have not really helped that much. It varies from company to company, um, but there have been uh, a fair number of companies uh, that have been recidivists, the most extreme example being Pfizer, which entered into no less than four successive deferred prosecutions or prosecutions, um, and the first three uh, clearly didn't do the trick. So for all those reasons, I favor prosecution of individuals but not companies. So, Ms. Caldwell, welcome. Uh, the judge makes some pretty compelling points, and he, he mentioned that um, the Deputy Attorney General, Sally Yates, uh, back in September of 2015, issued a new directive uh, in the department, shifting the focus of uh, prosecutions in this area to more uh, prosecutions of individuals. Uh, is that a, so two questions. Was that a, uh, a concession that the judge was right? Uh, and is right uh, that we should focus on individuals, and why don't we go further and focus only on individuals and forget about prosecuting corporations? So I couldn't agree more with the judge that it's very important to prosecute individuals, um, that individual prosecutions have the largest deterrent effect, more so than a corporate prosecution. Um, I think what the Yates memo tried to do and is doing was to address several different things. One was there was inconsistency across the Department of Justice about uh, what prosecutors looked to when they were doing corporate corporate cases, cases involving crime at a corporation. Uh, some prosecutors engaged in the best practices that are were laid out in the Yates memo, which is focus on the individuals, and, and you may still prosecute the company, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but you should really focus on the individuals first. And you should make sure that you get all the information there is to get about the individuals and determine whether it's worth bringing an individual prosecution you can also bring a corporate prosecution. So I think it was designed to address inconsistency within in the department. It was also designed to address what was a very real problem in our interaction with outside counsel representing companies, which was that companies would come in and they would be seeking some form of leniency, but they wouldn't really provide cooperation. They would provide information. Something bad happened. Mistakes were made. We can't tell you who did it because the data privacy laws of France won't allow it or name that country. There were a lot of investigations where companies came in and were seeking leniency from the government, either in the form of de declination of prosecution when we don't prosecute at all, a non-prosecution agreement where there's a written document that contains a lot of different provisions, a deferred prosecution agreement that the judge alluded to, or an actual charge where, that the company has to plead guilty to. So they're seeking leniency, but they're not telling us who are the individuals. Who are the people who did this? Who are the people who are responsible for this? So that's one other thing that the Yates memo is intended to address, is to make sure that if companies want to come in and get some form of leniency from the Department of Justice, they have to identify 
all the relevant facts about individuals who actually engaged in the underlying criminal activity. And part of the hope of that is that by receiving that information, we'll be better able to bring cases against individuals, which are not easy to do in the corporate context. I don't agree with the judge that there, the corporate prosecution itself is not useful. We don't bring that many corporate prosecutions in the, in the department. I don't have statistics with me, but we bring quite a few uh, deferred prosecution agreements and non-prosecution agreements, which are quite similar, except that in a deferred prosecution agreement, a charge is actually filed with the court. Uh, we don't indict that many companies, although we do, and we have had companies plead guilty in the last couple of years, but it's a very small number. These are companies that have um, that need a wake-up call. So I, when I was a prosecutor before, not in my current job, but when I was a prosecutor heading up the, the task force that was investigating the collapse of the Enron Corporation, we actually met with companies who would tell us that they could not resolve, they couldn't enter into any kind of agreement with us, a deferred prosecution agreement, yet they were planning to settle very onerous settlements with the SEC in this case. Uh, the SEC had, had laid out in lurid detail all of the bad behavior that the company had engaged in over a period of years and was seeking one billion dollar settlement from that company, which back then, now a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, uh, it's nothing, but back then that would have been unprecedented. And they were willing to resolve that case, and that was still back in the era when the SEC didn't require admissions. Um, they were going to resolve that case and they were going to neither admit nor deny the allegations, but the, the complaint was this thick. And my boss at the time, who had my current job, asked the CEO of the company, uh, who came to a meeting with us, how can you possibly say that you can resolve this case with the SEC with all these heinous allegations of, that undercut your very reason for existing when you can't enter into, you basically can't acknowledge the principle of respondeat superior in a deferred prosecution agreement, that your employees broke the law and you're responsible. And without missing a beat, the CEO said to my former boss, um, Nobody cares about the SEC. That's just a cost of doing business. So a company like that needs a wake-up call. And there, there, are, there aren't that many companies out there like that who view their regulators as inconveniences to be paid occasionally. But there are companies that obstruct justice. There are companies that, that lie to us. There are companies that are, as the judge mentioned, are recidivists. And there are situations where a corporate prosecution is needed to send a strong message. And I can tell you, I wasn't in private practice quite as long as you, but I was, I was representing companies. You're just a kid. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. I paid him to say that. Um, <laughs> but I was there for about 10 years and represented a bunch of companies who were under government investigation. And I can tell you that the companies very much take the prospect of criminal prosecution very seriously. It's a very serious reputational problem for them. They don't want to be criminally prosecuted. Uh, they, even if they don't view it as a cost of doing business, they would much rather settle with a the regulator. They would much rather get a declination or a non-prosecution agreement. So I do think that there are, there's a time and place for corporate prosecutions. But I do agree with the judge that the, it's preferable to focus on individuals. So I think we're, there's more commonality here than difference, but just uh, to pursue the, the, the corporate side, um, in, in uh, two thirds. Uh, the, the the great book on this is is by a professor uh, at the uh, University of Virginia Law School uh, named Brandon Garrett, who studied all the uh, corporate prosecutions, including deferred prosecution and non prosecution agreements, uh, for the last twenty years or so, and wrote a book called Too Big to Jail. And he points out that in two thirds of those situations, no individual was ever named. Um, so if this were the reverse, if individuals were typically prosecuted and occasionally they went after a corporation to give them a wake-up call, I still would have some philosophical problems with that, but I, I, I would be much less um, um, discomforted. Uh, but the, the experience, and that's why I think the Yates memo is such a good uh, step forward, the experience has been just the reverse that usually it's just been the corporation that's been gone after, uh, and rarely uh, individuals, and even more rarely, high-level individuals from substantial institutions like large banks and the, and the, and the uh, like. Uh, I think there are indications that's, that's changing, and, I, and that's terrific, but that's, that's I think, the, been my biggest objection. It, so two thirds, two thirds cases. There, it's a corporation prosecuted, no individuals. Ms. Caldwell, that is that 
not the right, what's the right balance? So I, I don't know the statistics and haven't read the book, although I'm certainly familiar with Professor Garrett. Um, I think that most cases, um, the, the preferred course is to prosecute the individuals. And if the Yates memo um, has the desired effect with companies, companies will come in and they'll cooperate and they'll provide information about individuals and they will behave in the way you would want a good corporate citizen to behave and they'll remediate whatever the problem is that, that led to the criminal conduct in the first place and there won't be a need to prosecute or maybe there can be some kind of a non-prosecution agreement instead of a, a, an actual charge being filed. So I think that's the idea. But there are many times, and again, corporate prosecutions are a small sliver of what we do in the criminal division. Our cases almost always involve individual prosecutions. Uh, I think, as I said, the Yates memo was meant to address, it was partly meant to address the, the public um, concern about the apparent absence of financial fraud prosecutions in the wake of the financial crisis. But there were, there, there were banks whose CEOs were prosecuted. They weren't J.P. Morgan Chase or Goldman Sachs, but they were tier one bank, bank in Nebraska, several other banks around the country that were important regional banks, and there were thousands of people, I think the number's more than 4,000, who were prosecuted in connection with some aspect of the mortgage fraud that led to the financial crisis. Um, there are times in, a, in corporate criminal prosecution where you have the evidence and times where you don't have the evidence. In a large, sprawling organization, I don't mean to comment on any specific bank, and I was, I was in private practice during the financial crisis in the immediate aftermath, and I have to say, I did see a couple things that caused me to raise my eyebrows about some fairly large institutions, but I don't know all the facts. I know that the department tried very hard to prosecute and to investigate those cases. You know, it's really hard to prosecute someone who's at the very top of a, of a pyramid that has 100,000 employees or 50,000 employees or 200,000 employees. Um, those people tend, I saw it yesterday, the sentencing, I don't know if you saw it, of, the, the, of Donald Blankenship, who was the CEO of Massey Cole, got the one-year maximum sentence. He, had, he was convicted of, of a misdemeanor. He was not convicted of um, some felony charges. I'm not that familiar with that case, so I don't mean to comment on that. But he was one of the most micromanaging CEOs that I've ever seen. He got reports every 30 minutes on the status of the running of the coal. Um, and he was constantly sending out emails to people about, we need to do this faster and that faster. Um, and he got acquitted on some of the more, all of the more significant charges. So it's, it can be very difficult, which is not to say we shouldn't try to do it, but it can be very difficult, even in a case where somebody's a micromanager, it's much less difficult, it's much more difficult when somebody is many, 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 many layers removed from the underlying misconduct. So it is difficult, but I don't think it's as difficult as, um, maybe the department uh, thought in the wake of the financial crisis. Uh, if you go back to earlier uh, crises that, in, at least in some respects, are comparable, you go back to the junk bond uh, bubble, everyone right up to Michael Milken was prosecuted. You go back to the savings and loan uh, crisis, which involved many financial institutions in the late 80s, early 90s, 800 people were successfully prosecuted right up to uh, Keating, who was the, the main player there. Uh, you go, and here uh, we should all give credit to, uh, to Leslie, we go to Enron and WorldCom. Uh, Enron uh, and WorldCom resulted in the conviction of the CEOs of both companies. Leslie was in charge of the Enron uh, task force. Um, the uh, Bernie Ebers, who was uh, uh, head of uh, WorldCom, uh, was in the uh, prosecuting the Southern District of New York and got 25 years. These cases can be made and were made. And why they weren't made with respect to the large banks in the wake of the financial crisis seems to me problematic. I had some civil cases involving uh, these matters in my court. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, and, you know, it seemed to me that the jury had no difficulty uh, finding liability uh, in those cases. Now, liability is not the same as proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, uh, and individuals are harder to prosecute than companies. Um, but um, I think um, 
the, often the theory that you would use to prosecute high-level individuals is conscious disregard. And I think, um, and here Leslie can help me out, but a good example of that uh, was the uh, BNP Paribas case, where that was a foreign corrupt practices uh, uh, prosecution of the company. The compliance people met with high-level management, as I understand it, and told them, we don't like what's going on, and it's very doubtful. And the management people said, in effect, yeah, but it's making us a lot of money. Uh, Now, what more do you need to convict, right? They couldn't convict in that case because the company obstructed justice, and by the time they found out the facts, as I understand, the statute of limitations had run. But But it's an example of what I think goes on that could be prosecuted in other circumstances. And I think BNP Paribas is a good example of one of the drivers for the Yates memo is because BNP Paribas, uh, very, as Judge Rakoff said, there was very clear evidence of intentional, deliberate evasion of sanctions laws and, and other laws. And there was very clear evidence that se- serious, significant, high-level compliance people had raised multiple red flags. BNP Paribas even had... It, it sought outside legal opinions from U.S. law firms about whether its conduct violated U.S. law. And law firm A said yes, so they went to law firm B. And law firm B said yes, too. And so they said, well, wait, you were supposed to mark draft on that opinion. Um, <laughs> and they continued to do the conduct, the underlying conduct, because it was extraordinarily lucrative for the company. And then when it came time for them to be, when they were under investigation, they didn't cooperate. Um, they obstructed the investigation. They made overly broad assertions about restrictions imposed on them by data privacy laws in various European countries to the extent that we got documents through the mutual legal assistance treaty process before we ever got them from BNP Paribas, which if any of you have studied the MLAT process, you'll know that that's extraordinary. That's a very slow process. So they, they and they also, they, they didn't tell us which individuals knew about things and were responsible for things, they, they would produce emails and they would say, um, and they would block out people's names. And so if it said, Judge Rakoff said X, it would be, um, Mr. X said X. And they did that for, for many years until we finally got documents from That's France. That's what I teach my law clerks. <laughs> <laughs> until we finally got documents from France and Switzerland um, through the MLAT process. So... You know, that was a company that got prosecuted. That was a company that needed to get prosecuted. Uh, And unfortunately, as the judge said, by the time we were able to um, uncover through the MLAT documents the names of the relevant people, it was too late because the statute of limitations had expired. Okay, I want to shift now to a little bit more uh, detail about the how. Uh, And you have both made reference to non-prosecution agreements and deferred prosecution agreements. Now, For individuals in federal court charged with a criminal offense, it's a rare thing to get a deferred prosecution agreement or a non-prosecution agreement. It's almost unheard of. Uh, In the prosecution of corporations, it's uh, standard uh, often, though, Ms. Caldwell, you said that there are cases where corporations plead guilty, but it's more often the case that they will get a deferred prosecution agreement or non-prosecution agreement. Why the difference in approach? Uh, It seems that that the, the premise is that it is appropriate because corporations can rehabilitate themselves uh, and the agreement is to that end, but, but we've given up on rehabilitation in many areas of the criminal justice system. Why do we have confidence in the corporate area that, that it uh, can be achieved? So I think first in, the, in the addressing the area of individuals briefly, um, there are deferred prosecution agreements with individuals. Uh, individuals obviously can go to jail, corporations can't. So. Um, First offenders, low-level offenders are often diverted, and there's a growing sentiment among the bench. I don't know if it's happening in your court, Judge, but among judges around the country that there should be more diversion for individuals, and I think we're starting to see that. Yes, although we're talking about a totally different kind yes. of person here. I, we're, this is dealing with the problem, which is not on our agenda right. today, of mass incarceration in this country, where people who commit low-level, nonviolent crimes are sent to prison for substantial periods of time, uh, many in the state system, which uh, uh, is beyond either of our control. Uh, But there have been uh, some hopeful steps uh, 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 towards diversion in those cases. But that's a a totally different kind of defendant than we're talking about here. But but just uh, to sort of put the point here, 
it, those are cases where those, as you say, those are low-level offenders. But Ms. Caldwell, you described case w that it's appropriate to prosecute corporations when it's a conduct when it's you know atrocious conduct that fills up a document that's this big. Why is deferred prosecution appropriate then? So the big difference between corporations and individuals is corporations can't go to jail. Whether they're big or small, they can't go to jail. So we can generally achieve as much as we could, sometimes more than we could, through a prosecution by entering into a deferred prosecution agreement or a non-prosecution agreement. Those are negotiated dispositions in which we generally require the corporation to pay a certain amount of money, uh, which varies from case to case and fact pattern to fact pattern. We generally require the corporation to undertake some remedial measures that are tailored to whatever, hap whatever the wrongdoing was or whatever the deficiencies are in the corporate um, compliance process. And we've recently brought in, because we recognize that there have been, that that hasn't been perfect, and I'm not promising that it's going to turn to perfect, but we recently brought in a, compl a compliance expert into our fraud section who is a former chief compliance officer at three different companies in three different industries to better inform what we ask for from corporations and what we try to suggest and to better evaluate corporations' compliance. We can also ask for um, other remedial measures that we wouldn't necessarily get. If, if a company is charged and they want to plead guilty, they get sentenced. Um, we can't necessarily impose all of those things on them. So uh, I think the, the, um, the motivation for deferred prosecutions is partly the problem that I have with going after corporations, which is the collateral consequences. So a company is saying, you know, we would much we think you should agree to a deferred prosecution because if we have to plead guilty, we're going to be barred from this industry or we're going to, uh, it's going to have terrible effects on our uh, uh, ability to do business in various countries of the world uh, or all sorts of collateral consequences, which won't be true if it's a deferred prosecution or a non-prosecution. So you see the tension here. If deferred prosecutions, if corporate prosecutions were really to achieve their maximum of impact, then you would want a guilty plea, an admission, a huge fine, and compliance programs that were followed up over a period of years uh, with, frankly, a federal judge helping to monitor it. But that would have all sorts of negative consequences for perfectly innocent people, shareholders and employees and others. Um, and so having gone down this route of prosecuting or going after corporations, the department then says, well, but we want to avoid the worst consequences, so we'll enter into a deferred prosecution. To my mind, it sends very mixed signals um, that doesn't really enhance um, the credibility of the criminal law. So I, I don't I, I think that there's some part of what you just said that I agree with, which is that I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there has been a little bit of naivete on the part of the department, um, and I'll say that it's gone now that I'm there. Um, <laughs> but about what the real collateral consequences might that might likely happen, what's real and what's not. So I did this as a defense lawyer. I'm sure the judge did too. You go into the government and you say, please don't indict my client because it'll cause the loss of a million jobs. The company will collapse. It'll have a domino effect on the economy. Um, BNPP even went so far as to write a mock newspaper article on the masthead of, of Le Figaro, excuse my French accent, um, dateline the day after BNPP pled guilty. And it was it was... BNPP declared bankruptcy. Um, the French account, all the banks in France, I'm exaggerating a little bit, not much. All the banks in France collapsed. The European economy is in disarray, and the US is next. And that was designed to convince us. I, I guess I needed like a cartoon or something, a visual aid to be convinced that there really were going to be these horrible collateral consequences. So we hear that in every single corporate case. We hear that there are going to be devastating collateral consequences of one form or another, some more dire than others. And we do pressure test those, and we do. We do look into those because there could be real. I mean, there are cases where a company really does not have the ability 
to pay uh, the amount of money that otherwise would have to pay. And there are, co- there are times when a company really might be driven into bankruptcy. And we're not looking to drive companies into bankruptcy, particularly large companies that employ a large number of people. So we do listen to collateral consequences, but I think that we've grown much more skeptical of the presentations that we've hear because we always hear the same thing and then the next day after the company pleads guilty its stock goes up. So we've we've grown very skeptical of those kinds of presentations. So when you when you all become corporate defense lawyers, you know, you gotta fine tune those a little bit, come up with some new ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's very telling the fact that when these settlements are reached, the next day, the stock price goes up. Oh, so you, we pay $2 billion. Well, that's pocket change. We're really now through with this problem with the darn old Department of Justice. Uh, the, my recollection, I could be wrong on this, but I think I'm right, that uh, shortly after J.P. Morgan entered into one of these settlements where uh, – it was two billion or something like that, two point four billion dollars. Uh, not only did the stock price go up, but the CEO received a forty percent raise. Um, uh, the so um, I, I'm skeptical that this is viewed as more than an economic situation by the companies involved. The the um, uh, now there's no doubt that the department has grown. Uh, uh, more attuned to um, or um, uh, more um, ready to forge ahead uh, despite the protestations that the world will collapse that it used to be. And that's uh, uh, a a positive step. But I think the, the whole focus on this is the wrong focus. Think of the deterrent effect if the CEO of any of these banks had gone to prison. Immensely greater, I suggest, than um, going after any of those banks. Now, the, don't get me wrong, I, I have no personal knowledge that any of these CEOs committed a crime or not. I'm just contrasting the difference between individual prosecution and corporate prosecution. But if I can, if I can just keep drilling down on the DPAs, NPAs, as, as they're called in the biz. Uh, there's part of it is the paying of this big fine, which may or may not have an effect. Stock price might go up or down. But they also, as you mentioned earlier, they contain provisions that are forward-looking, that are designed to reform the corporation. And, and, we're, and as Ms. Caldwell talked about before, we're talking about corporations where there's a record of, of vast wrongdoing across the corporation. So the, 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 as I understand the agreements, they're designed to address that with compliance programs, ethics training, compliance officer reporting, and so forth. Um, that sounds great. That sounds like everybody wins. What's wrong with that, Judge? So there are two problems with that. The first is um, that I don't think it works. Um, that's really part of what uh, uh, Brendan Garrett's study showed. And the poster child for this is Pfizer. So uh, Pfizer entered successively into four agreements with the government over a period of a decade. And the first three were deferred prosecutions, and the last was a guilty plea. And in each case, the Department of Justice and Pfizer said what's really critical about this is the compliance measures we've put in place because that will prevent this misconduct or other misconduct from occurring uh, again. And on paper, it always looked great. And yet, they went and committed a new crime. And so there was a second deferred prosecution and a third deferred prosecution and finally a guilty plea. And uh, even after the guilty plea, there was a statement uh, saying um, uh, we've now for sure we've imposed it. Actually, at that point, the highest fine in history uh, was imposed. But we've also put in uh, compliance measures that will solve everything. And two years later, Pfizer was back again uh, with still another criminal problem, this one under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Why 
was the approach taken that was of successive deferred prosecutions and supposed compliance measures that weren't working, it was because in the pharmaceutical industry, if the company had pled guilty in the, to the actual crimes committed, they would be out of business totally. And they, for understandable reasons, the government wasn't willing to do that. That's because of pharmaceutical laws that are in place. Um, but the compliance, you have to look at that case and say it was window dressing. It wasn't real. Now, why wasn't it real? I think a major reason is that the department does not do a particularly good job on following up. They're doing a better job now than they used to. Uh, but um, except in those rare cases where you have a really hands-on corporate monitor uh, 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 put in place, um, the uh, it it tends to be more checking uh, boxes. Um, so if you're a corporate executive and you have a whole bunch of new compliance measures in place, you are tempted to view it uh, the way most corporate executives view government regulation. Oh, gosh, here's another uh, box we have to check. Here's another form we have to file. It's not like we're internalizing a different attitude. Now, I'm tarring a huge number of people with a broad brush, and then there are great exceptions. In my experience, if the CEO is really devoted to making sure the company is a good corporate citizen, you don't need any compliance programs. Um, that, that will send a message. And if the CEO is not, all the compliance programs in the world uh, won't help you. Um, so I'm very skeptical about how much is achieved uh, through compliance programs. So I think um, one of the things we've tried to do in, in the criminal division is to get smarter about compliance. Um, that's why we hired the Compliance Council, who has a lot of experience from three different industries, pharma, um, tech, and I forget the third one, financial services. Um, she's very experienced, and she's looking at when companies come in and start to be under investigation, she's looking to see what was their pre-existing compliance program at the time of the problem, whatever it was. What remedial measures have they undertaken, and are they appropriate? And what additional remedial measures, if any, should we ask for? And I do think that um, there's been a huge upgrade in public companies in the last decade in their compliance programs. Compliance programs, compliance officers used to sit in like the dusty office across the street. They used to pay, make significantly less than other corporate executives. They used to not report, they would report to somebody in the legal department. Um, now they're in the, in the C-suite, they're making appropriate amounts of money, they're appropriately empowered, and not at every company, but at many, many more companies. And they have real authority and they can report directly to the audit committee or maybe the CEO or whoever, somebody very high up in the company if they see a problem. So I do think there's been a very dramatic change in the last decade or so in the empowerment of compliance. And I think that companies um, get that they have to have a serious compliance program. I'll talk for a minute about the FCPA space because I think that's an easy one to talk about. Um, FCPA is very hard to police, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It's If you're operating in name that country um, in probably 75% of the world, you are going to at least be asked, pressured, to violate the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So you've got to have really, really robust compliance in those countries. And even with robust compliance, it's very challenging still to avoid violating the act. Um, it's, I'm not going to go into more boring detail, but it's very, very difficult. And I think companies get that. They get the, the devastating effect that a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act prosecution could have on a company. Um, and I think I'm, I've, I had a client when I was in private practice where the CEO, they didn't have an FCPA compliance program. And this was not that long ago, and this was a Fortune 100 company. Um, and they were creating one, and the general counsel wanted the CEO to sign it and send it out to the field. And the CEO said, I'm not going to sign that. We don't hire those kind of people. <laughs> and the general counsel said, yes, we do. They're called human beings. <laughs> um, so I think it's, I agree with Judge Rakoff that the tone of the top is critical. But I also think you've got to have, particularly when you're operating in challenging jurisdictions, you've got to have very clear direction, not just in the form of a tone at the top message, but in terms of what's allowed and what's not allowed. 
And I think the companies are getting that and that they're taking it very seriously, certainly much more seriously than they did even 10 years ago. I want to ask one last drill down question before I open it up for questions. And uh, Judge Rakoff said, at one moment said, if you, and I'm paraphrasing, but, but it, the gist of it was, if you, the only way a compliance program is going to work is if you have the judge involved. And I think I saw you smile. Ms. Me. Caldwell. Yes, you did. Because I, <laughs> she, she laughed out loud. <laughs> I would say that if, if anyone knows less about compl corporate compliance than, than our department, it might be, with present company excluded, <laughs> um, judges on the federal bench. The judges just really don't have the capability to drill down like a corporate monitor does and see what is happening and on a day-to-day -day basis in different parts of the company. And the judges have very full plates, and they couldn't possibly under, uh, take on that responsibility. Um, it's challenging enough for our monitors who are focused on just one company to do it effectively. Well, the, I don't totally disagree with that. Um, I, I start with the assumption born of personal experience that uh, judges are dumbbells <laughs> pretending to be experts. But uh, the... Uh, uh, I think the role of the judge is enforcing follow-up. What the the uh, what's happened with many of these uh, deferred prosecutions in the past is that when they were first enunciated, it all sounded great, and then there was very limited follow-up, and uh, even when there were corporate monitors. Appointed. Sometimes those monitors were very assiduous, and sometimes they were not. Sometimes it was just a nice uh, cash cow for their law firms. Um, and so every case is different. Uh, my feeling is that uh, if you that most judges uh, would demand uh, periodic uh, accounting as to the effectiveness and the follow up on the. Um, compliance programs that were in place um, and that that would be an added uh, benefit. I don't mean to suggest at all that that would be uh, uh, the most material factor, but I think it would be uh, an added benefit um, uh, because uh, just like uh, companies uh, fear uh, the Department of Justice, every once in a while, they even fear a federal judge. So, oh, They fear you way more than they fear us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to open it up for questions, and um, I'd ask you to try to be focused in your questions. Um, Ms. Kastner will bring the microphone around um, and, and try to just ask one question and be focused. <laughs> Dennis. Uh, Thanks. Um, so it sounds like you both agree that we face challenges in holding corporations and their employees accountable. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that the conversation seems to be about strategy within the context of the existing law rather than what seems to have been the pattern in the past, which is to create new law to address a given problem, starting with the Sherman Act. Do you think there's a need for new law here, or do you think that existing law can handle the problem? So I think that existing law can handle it properly. I think that we have, you know, when, when there's a, some kind of a crisis, the instinct in Congress is always, maybe not now since they aren't really doing anything, but the instinct has historically always been, we need more laws. We need longer sentences. We need different, so in the wake of the Enron crisis, there were all sorts of new laws enacted. We didn't really, in my view, I, we didn't really need those laws. We just need smarter use of the laws that we have. The mail fraud and the wire fraud statute and a few other statutes are perfectly capable of addressing almost all corporate crime, along with the securities fraud laws. Um, so I don't think we need new laws. I just think we need to be more thoughtful and um, careful in how we do those cases. I think one thing that you'll see, that I see now from my vantage point in the criminal division, that I didn't see as much before when I was an assistant US attorney, is the wide disparity around the country of the level of expertise among federal prosecutors in white collar cases. So I think we need to maybe be smarter about how those cases get distributed and how they get managed, but I think the laws on the books are more than enough. So I totally agree with that. I think the existing laws are more than adequate 
uh, to the situation. And on the whole, they've been broadly interpreted, the mail fraud statute being a prime example, to deal with new frauds and new uh, devices uh, that come come up. Um, the uh, I also very much agree with uh, the need uh, f- um, th- that there is a great disparity in the uh, expertise in this area of different offices, and the um, uh, that needs to be taken account of, I think, in um, uh, how uh, cases are assigned. Uh, uh, many, many years ago, the most important insider trading case to come before the Supreme Court uh, in the uh, 1990s was the called the O'Hagan case. The U.S. attorney in Minneapolis, I know this from personal knowledge because I represented someone indirectly involved in that case, initially said, I don't want that case. What's insider trading? That's some obscure kind of thing. I I can't deal with that. Uh, You know, and he only reluctantly, the venue properly belonged in that area. He And then, of course, ultimately, the department won a huge victory in the Supreme Court in that case. So... Um, there is, uh, I think that is a problem that uh, I'm glad to hear that, that the department is sensitive to that. Hi, thanks so much for coming, Assistant Caldwell and uh, Judge Rakoff. My question is for Judge Rakoff. Um, so when it comes to kind my, of hanging... My friend here will answer it, however. So. <laughs> <laughs> so a minute ago, you kind of hung out the red meat of, you know, imagine if we had a CEO from one of the big banks who, who went to prison. I just kind of want to explore that a little bit. So um, how do we come to anything more than a hunch about um, the likelihood that we would have gotten convictions in the subset of cases where there's DPAs? And I, I know Garrett um, has a lot of statistics around these things. But it seems to me like, at the end of the day, it, it sort of ascribes a kind of timidity to the department. and and. I just wonder how credible I find that, considering that um, <laughs> nothing would be better for uh, people in the department's career to go after these people. And maybe what's behind it, um, perhaps, and I'm curious what you think about this, you know, we, when these cases have been prosecuted, KPMG, Anderson, um, Blankenship, um, they turn out to be sort of long range, extremely time consuming. Um, and often, even when you win, you get a year. So, so how, how, how do you have anything more than a hunch about the likelihood of getting the red meat? So thank you for that simple and straightforward question. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, so taking different aspects of it. First of all, as the examples I gave before, Enron, WorldCom, um, uh, the SNL crisis, Michael Milken in the um, uh, junk bond bubble. Uh, the, these were not only successful prosecutions, but it was those folks going to jail that I think had the greatest impact on the public and on uh, people who were tempted to c- commit similar crimes in the future. And those were widespread crimes. The the SNL uh, had some similarities to the uh, financial crisis we just went to. It wasn't as large and it didn't impact other parts of the uh, company, but it was many, many savings and loan associations overvaluing uh, assets and and uh, uh, doing it because it was good business uh, for them and they made a lot of money out of doing that. Um, so uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, there's particular difficulty to the extent that it can't be done. So then you say, well, okay, so why wasn't it done? Because a prosecutor would love to bring a case against some high-level person. Uh, Leslie may have some views of that, but I'll I'll tell you my hunches. Um, I think there were uh, three reasons. Uh, The first uh, was that there was a huge diversion after 9-11 of people, particularly in the FBI. The FBI took a thousand agents who were on white collar criminal investigation matters, the, pe- the very agents who had done the SNL work, and transferred them to anti terrorism. Now, that makes perfect sense. I'm not going to uh, argue that wasn't the right decision. Uh, but there you had uh, the heart of the FBI's 
uh, expertise transferred into a different area. So there was a lack of expertise. Closely related to that is, I think, a lack of expertise on the part of most U.S. attorneys' offices. And there's a um, sort of, of ca- chicken and egg aspect. The longer you go without prosecuting and investigating individuals, the fewer people you have who know how to go about doing it. Um, so uh, there was that problem. A second problem, uh, maybe special to the uh, financial crisis, was that the government of the United States was deeply involved in creating the conditions that led to that crisis. Not that they were consciously committing fraud, but there had been for more than a decade huge pressure put on the banks and on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to make more and more mortgages available to people who really were not qualified to have mortgages. Uh, It was all uh, dressed up as, as a socially progressive thing. We want everyone to own a house. We're tired of banks refusing uh, uh, poor people uh, the mortgages they need to own a home and all like that. Uh, and the, um, uh, the result was what are called liar's loans, which the banks then took and securitized and made a lot of money out selling pools of mortgages Um, uh, uh, But there was a lot of government involvement. There was also a lot of government involvement in the steps when the crisis first hit and various banks and brokerage firms uh, were uh, faced uh, with ruin. And in the case of Lehman Brothers did go under, the government brought very strong pressure on uh, various banks to do deals, to do mergers. Um, in, in connection with which, uh, according to the SEC, considerable fraud uh, was uh, perpetrated. The government wasn't a party to the fraud, but they were the ones who were pushing intensely uh, these arrangements that then were accomplished in part by fraud. Um, uh, so it's hard, I think, then to prosecute in those situations when part of the defense is going to be, you made me do it. Um, uh, and the third factor uh, is the one we sort of alluded to uh, previously. Uh, it be, a corporation, in the end, is going to have to come to terms with the government. They They have too much to... Uh, lose to fight. If you fight like Arthur Anderson, you go out of business. And so um, the, the deals are going to be struck. Um, the pre Perara of all people, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, wrote an article, a law review article in 2007, in which he said uh, one of the biggest problems with the prosecution of corporations is a corporation has to come to terms. They can't, they don't, it's not really ultimately a fair fight. Well, the one result of that is these are relatively easy cases to make. They're made much more swiftly than cases against individuals. So you have limited resources, you have limited expertise, you have the government involvement. And where are you going to put your resources? You're going to put it in what is almost surely going to be a victory, something that you can announce with a great deal of uh, pride. We today uh, extracted $2 billion from Bank X, um, and much less so on the much more difficult but doable, in my view, job of going after individuals. So I think that's part of the problem. It's another reason why I love the Yates Memo. I think the Yates Memo is, is a breath of fresh air because I think it refocuses that balance and says we are not going to be satisfied anymore in the Department of Justice with just going after the company. We need to go after the individuals. Just one thing, very briefly to, to I don't, I, I wasn't in the department in the wake of the financial crisis, so I don't know what the evidence was or wasn't in any given case. But I do know that um, sometimes the department can be a little overly democratic in how it doles out cases. And if you've never done a really big white collar case, and you're doing your first one, the temptation is really to 
kind of boil the ocean and try to find everything and make it the mother of all cases. And once you've done a few, you realize that the better strategy is to zero in on something. Like in the Enron case, we zeroed in on the fact that Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling, the two highest executives, knew that Enron was circling the drain and they were telling the public that everything was great. Um, that was much easier than proving that they knew every single accounting entry was false. Um, and frankly, it, it went to actually the gravamen of what they did as opposed to what others below them did. So I think that's, that's a challenge in, in big cases is, is learning, and it's not just white collar cases, any big case. The trick is to really learn how to focus on what is the essence of this case and keep your eye on that ball. Um, so we have time for just one more quick question. Yes. Uh, Two-thirds of corporate prosecutions are only against the corporation, only one-third target individuals. How do we change that, and then how do we measure success, given the evidentiary issues of prosecuting uh, individuals at these corporations? One, whether the elements of the crime aren't met with the evidence that we have against particular individuals. Two, if the conduct is more systemic and we can't point to a specific CEO or board decision authorizing this conduct. And three, more of a fairness concern in that if we can prosecute the mid-level and the low level, we have sufficient evidence for that, but we can't get the CEOs or CEOs are more likely to be acquitted, then that tends to um, perhaps undermine the integrity of the, of the criminal justice system in the eyes of the public. OK, I'm going to be like the NPR announcer and say, we, we have two minutes left. OK, Judge? <laughs> well, I, no, it's your turn. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that was a lot of questions in one. Um, <laughs> So there are cases where it's very difficult to prove that any one person at a company was responsible for the criminal conduct. There are other cases where it's easy to prove that a very low-level person actually pressed send and wrote the email or whatever the underlying fact is, but it's very difficult to prove that they did that not of their own accord, but because somebody else told them to. There are situations where we could prosecute that really low-level person, but we don't think it would be fair, and we don't do it. Um, it can be very difficult to prosecute the most senior executives because they're often very, very insulated by many layers. They may not have done anything wrong, but even if they did something wrong, they're insulated by many, many layers. For example, in the end, not to keep talking about the Enron case, but the two top executives did not even have email. So we had to use kind of the kind of tactics we used in a more traditional criminal organized crime type investigation, which is get the people who actually press send and flip them and get the, and basically work up the chain. And that's what we had to do in the Enron case. That's a hard thing to do, and it takes a really long time. And you have to have, we had a big team, and we were able to do it. But not all cases have that level of resources. So just following up on that, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, most of these cases against high level uh, folks are made by flipping someone at a lower level. And it is, in that sense, it is, the organized crime uh, analogy is exactly on point. Uh, there are huge pressures uh, not to flip if you're a soldier in an organized crime family, because uh, you might lose your life, for example. Uh, 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 but uh, nevertheless, if the government, uh, uh, if you're facing uh, life imprisonment, you may flip. Um, and in the white collar uh, area, there are not the same kind of pressures, but there are considerable, um, if you will, uh, atmospheric pressures against flipping. But the government can bring enough pressure to make you flip, and then you work your way up. And at the top level, just to repeat what I said before, I think it's often a case of conscious disregard. Not always, but uh, often a case of conscious disregard. But that's that's perfectly good proof under our, on, under our system of, of, of evidence. So I want to thank both of you for a terrific uh, discussion um, and exchange of views. And um, please uh, join me in thanking um, Judge Rakoff and Ms. Galbraith.